In this video, we're going to discuss digit cycles, Euler's totient function, Euler's totient theorem, Fermat's little theorem, modular inverses, Wilson's theorem, and how they can be used to simplify this tricky Amy problem. It was infamous at the time, but now with their technique, easy to solve. And we'll also be discussing how the binomial theorem can be used. Well, let's start off back to the basics, digit cycles. So to calculate large digits of a number, a to the b, a strategy is to just write some things out and look for a pattern. Let's see a quick example. Let k equal to, oh, 2008 squared plus 2 to the 2008. What's the unit digit of k squared plus 2 to the k? Oh, wow. So first of all, what is k? We're, what, what is k? Do we need to find k? I mean, it's going to be some giant number, maybe like several hundred digits for sure. We don't care what the whole k is. Look here. We're looking for the units digit of k. Okay, so we've got this kind of two-part expression here. Let's focus, let's zone in on, on the first part, k squared. What's the unit digit of k squared? Well, if you watched the previous part on modular arithmetic, you know that k times k mod 10, which is the unit digit, is just equal to k mod 10 times the, the unit digit of k times the unit digit of k. So what this essentially means is to find the unit digit of k squared, it's just the square of the unit digit of k. Okay, so this is square, that thing here, the k squared right there is square of k unit digit. So what is the unit digit of k in the first place? Oh no, that's another problem, problem isn't it? Now we've got another two-step problem, but don't worry. We know modular arithmetic, so it's going to be good to solve. So what's the unit digit of 2008 squared? Well, we look at the last digit because to find the 2008 squared mod 10, it's just 8 squared mod 10, which is 64 mod 10. But 64 mod 10 is the same as 4 mod 10. So 2008 squared has the unit digit of 4 mod, or is 4 mod 10. Now here's where the tricky, the digit cycle part comes in. What's the unit digit of 2 to the power of 2008? That's a large number and something that we are not multiplying in this video. I know, it's very boring to multiply 2, 2008 times. So let's instead, let's look for a pattern. We can multiply it a few times. So 2 to the power of 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 cubed is 8. 2 to the 4, well, it's 16, but it has a unit digit of 6. So let's just say it's congruent to 6 mod 10. Then 2 to the 5 is congruent to 6 times 2, which is 12, or just 2 mod 10. And I'm going to stop writing the mod 10s. I'm just going to write equivalent to, because you know what I'm talking about now. 2 to, two to the power of 6 is 4 mod 10. 2 to the power of 7 is 8 mod 10. 2 to the 8 is 6 mod 10. You notice a pattern here? That's always what we want to do. Look for a pattern. And try, try observing one. It's 2, 4, 8, 6. 2, 4, 8, 6. And it repeats. And that's going to be true forever. Because that's a cycle. So... 2 to the power of 2008. Well, because it cycles every 4, 2 to the 2008 will fall on to 2 to the 4th part of the cycle. Because 2008 is a multiple of 4, therefore, we'll keep cycling 2, 4, 6, or 2, 4, 8, 6, until we eventually land at 2008, which is a multiple of 4. So it will be on the 6th part, part of the cycle. Because it's multiple of 4, and all multiples of 4 leave a remainder of 6, as you can see here. So therefore, 2 to the power of 2008 leaves a remainder of 6 when divided by 10. Isn't that cool? So, this is, so that means k is just 6 plus 4, which is 0 mod 10. Right? 
So we have 2 to the 2008 is 6 mod 10. So we add them up, we get k is 0 mod 10, because 6 plus 4 is 0 mod 10. So the square of the unit digit is nothing but 0. Now what about 2 to the k? k, well, how do we do that? Huh? Hmm. Well, notice how earlier we found that the 2 to the power is cycle in 4s. So all we have to do is find the value of k mod 4, and we can find 2 to the k. But what is k mod 4? Well, that's easy enough. Well, notice how 2008 is a multiple of 4, right? Because 2008 is a multiple of 4, so 2008 squared is a multiple of 4 as well, of course. So, what about 2 to the power of 2008? Is that a multiple of 4 as well? Of course it is! 2 to the 2008 is literally way, has way more factors of 2 than 2 squared, 4. So, therefore, k is 0 mod 4. Isn't that cool? It's 0 mod 4. So that means 2 to the k will lie on this part of the cycle, the fourth term again. So 2 to the k is 6 mod 10. So the sum is, yes, 6 mod 10. And we are done. Okay, so let's summarize the steps we did so far. Basically what we did is we found the value of k mod 10 first, and then we substituted that back, we used that using digit cycles. We looked for a pattern based on the cycles of 2. And then after that, we looked for k squared. So we easily found k squared to be 4 mod 10. And then in our final term over here, we just found k squared by squaring 0, which is obviously 0, and then again use the digit cycles to find 2 to the k mod 10. So 6, final answer, and we're ready to move on to Euler's Toshit function. Now this is the most cool function ever. Basically, if we have this prime factorization there, this is going to be our Toshit, this thing right there. So basically, what we do is we multiply our number n by 1 minus e to the primes. So n times 1 minus 1 over the first prime times 1 minus 1 over the second prime, so on. So the trick here is you find the prime factorization, that's step one. Then you, for all primes, you calculate this term here, 1 minus 1 over the prime. And then you multiply all those together. And then finally, you multiply by the original number itself. So this, let's take a quick example, 40. Find totient or phi of 40. Well, 40 is 2 cubed times, 2 cubed times 5. So what we do is we do 40 this is the n term, times 1 minus 1 over 2, because there's a 2, times 1 minus 1 over 5, right? And this simplifies to 40 times half times 4 fifths, which is 20 times 4 fifths equals 16. So the torsion of 40 is 16. And by the way, this is also useful for calculating the, the number of numbers less than or equal to n that is relatively prime to n. But we're going to be using it for something else. We're going to be using it for Euler's Toshin theorem specifically. But first, let's discuss Fermat's Little Theorem, which is kind of like a, the baby version of Euler's Toshin theorem, which only works for primes. I know, only boring primes. But essentially what Fermat's Little Theorem says is that a to the p minus 1 is always 1 mod p. And this is true if only p is a prime. And also we must have that a and p don't share any common factors. So for example, 2 to the power of, of let's say, 2, 2 to the 4 is congruent to 1 mod 5, because 4 is 1 mod 5. And we can use this to calculate things like 2 to the 8 equals also 1 mod 5. Because 2 to the 8 squared is just 2 to the 4 squared is just 2 to the 8. So it's going to be just 1 squared, which is 1 mod 5. Okay, but the key thing to note here is this condition here. A lot of people sometimes forget it. This is very important, and if you don't include this condition, it's going to be completely wrong. So why is this true? So it's true because it's saying that these terms can't share any common factors. So for example, 
let's say this was five to the power of eight of a four is congruent to one mod five. Is this true? Well, by this technically it is, but no, because five and five share a common factor. And clearly you can see that this is just going to be zero mod five, not one mod five. So that's why it's sometimes help, more helpful to use this version of Fermat's little theorem, which states that a to the p is a mod p. And this is actually kind of easier to remember. a to the p is a mod p. It's like a p, then a p. So it's much easier to remember than this version here. So basically, it's this as long as a is not a multiple of p for Fermat's little theorem. But now let's go back to Euler's totient theorem, the big giant, the more powerful theorem. Now we're saying that, okay, now it's not just primes anymore. It's, we're talking about all numbers, all numbers we're talking about here. So basically what that says is that a to the power of totient n is one mod n. As long as this condition is true, which you should always make sure to check. So for example, let's say, remember we found totient of 40 is 16. So we have some a to the 16, or let's say five to the 16, or not five, seven to the 16 is one mod 40. Now, what about, like I just earlier was about to say, five to the 16, is that one mod 40? Of course not. Of course not, because one mod 40 is not a multiple of five, but five is a multiple of five. So again, make sure that your base, base of the exponent and your mod don't share any common factors. You will mess up if you don't remember to check this. And it's a very common mistake. So it's definitely something you should watch out for. Okay, so now we're on to modular inverses. Basically, a mo modular inverse states that A is a modular inverse of B if the product is one mod N. So, like, for example, 3 and 4 are modular inverses in mod 11 because 3 times 4 is 12 and 12 is 1 mod 11. So, essentially, for every number, or not every number, for every number relatively prime to n, there's always a modular inverse. And this is very useful for theorems like this one. It's useful for proving theorems like this one. So, what is Wilson's theorem? Wilson's theorem states that p minus 1 factorial is negative 1 mod p. So, for example, 6 factorial is negative 1 mod 7. You can think about remembering this by seeing that, oh, it's p, and then minus 1, so then we take p minus 1. It kind of all makes sense, doesn't it? p, you've got p here, minus 1 here, and then p minus 1 here. So that's kind of how, a little trick to remember it. And now we've got this cool problem from the Amy over here. Let a of n be equal to 6 to the n plus a to the n. Determine the remainder upon dividing a of 83 by 49. Ah, that seems like a tricky problem. So essentially what you're, we're trying to do is, we're trying to think, we're trying to figure out that 6 to the 83 plus a to the 83 mod 49. Hmm, how should we do this? 83 is a big number. We've got two parts. Let's let's look at each of them separately. That's that's gonna make things a lot easier. And then we can always add them. Right? So let's break it into two parts. Let's say let's draw a big line down the center. We've got 6 to the 83 mod 49. What is 6 to the 83 mod 49? How do we find this? Well, the key thing to note here is we can use Euler's Totient theorem. What does Euler's totient theorem state? It states that a to the power of totient n is 1 mod n, as long as a and n don't share any common factors. So in this case, let's say a is 6, right? Because we have a base of 6. And n, our n is 49, of course, because, well, that's the base we're looking at here. So essentially what we have to do here is what is totient n, first of all? Totient of 49. Totient 49, well, we can evaluate that pretty easily. Basically, what we do is 49 is 7 squared. So, because 49 is 7 squared, then the totient is just 49 times 
1 minus 1 7. Or 49 times 6 over 7 is 42. So 6 to the power of 42 is 1 mod 49. Isn't that cool? That is an application of Euler's totient theorem that we just learned. So if we know this, how do we find this? Well, we well we know that then now we know that six to the eighty three is equivalent to six to the forty one mod forty nine, right? Because we just divide out by six to the forty two, which is one mod forty nine. But six to the forty one is still a giant number, and we're not going to be multiplying six times six times six times six a bunch of times. That's not we're not here to do that. We're here to do stuff that's more smart. So the trick here is to see that six to the forty one it's it should seem suspicious. It's it's almost six to the forty two, isn't it? So if only we can write this using negative exponents, if only we could do that. Well, we actually can. Six to the forty one. We can again divide out by six to the forty two, because six to the forty two is one mod forty nine. It's the same as six to the forty one divided by six to the forty two, which is six to the power of negative one mod forty nine. Now you might be confused here but and wonder. 6 to the negative 1 is 1 6. How can we take that mod 49? That's not even an integer. Well, the key thing here is that essentially what we're doing is we're saying 6 to the 41 divided by 6 to the 41, but we can't divide by another 6. So instead, we just multiply by its modular inverse. Because its modular inverse is a number such that it's a number such that AB is 1 mod that. So the modular inverse of 6 is a number such that 6b is 1 mod 49. So if we can find what that number, if we can find what that number is, then that's, we can, but instead of dividing by 6, we can kind of see that b is 1 6 mod 49 or 1 times the inverse of 6 mod 49. So essentially, we're dividing out by 41 powers of 6, and then we're multiplying by the modular inverse of 6, because we can't divide by another factor of 6. So we just multiply by a number that's essentially has a product of 6 equals 1 mod 49. So this just becomes 1, and we're just left with the modular inverse of 6. Let's write that as 6 modular inverse, which is sometimes written in this notation, but it's not 1 6, just so you know. And Oh, what about the 8th part? Well, a to the 83 mod 49. We know by the same logic, a to the power of 42 is 1 mod 49. 8 doesn't share any factors with 49, so we're good. Cool. So we get something similar by the same logic. a to the negative 1 mod 49 is the same thing as this. So now all we have to do is find the values of the modular inverses mod 49. How do we do that? That's basically the product, the number such so, so that the product is negative 1 mod 49. So what number 6a times is equal to 6 times what number is negative 1 or 1 mod 49? Now, for most cases, the trick here would just be to do guess and check. And it's usually not that bad. But in this case, notice, notice something clever. 6 times 8 is 48, and 48 is negative 1 mod 49, right? So, but 6 times negative 8, right, in mods you can work with negatives too. 6 times negative 8 is negative 48, which is the same thing as 1 mod 49. Aha! So the modular inverse is negative 8. Or we can also write that as 41 if you don't like negatives. 41, same thing as negative 8 mod 49. Okay, cool. Now what about this right over here? Well, it's the same thing. 8a, or let's say not a, let's say b is 1 mod 49. So again, 8 times 6 is four, four, negative 1 mod 49. So 8 times negative 6 would be 1 mod 49. Yay! So now, negative 6 is a modular inverse here, and this would be negative 8. So what happens if we add them up? We get negative 14. So the sum is negative 14, 
So that's not the answer. We always have to convert to a positive number. We add 49, boom, 35. So the answer to this problem is just going to be equal to 35. A very interesting problem. Let's quickly recap. Basically, what we did first is we split it up. We know we can always add them up at the end. And then we knew, found this by Euler's quotient theorem. And then we saw that 6 to the 83 is just 6, the modular inverse of 6 mod 49. Because we can essentially, the, it's essentially 6 to the 83 times what will be equal to 1 mod 49. So essentially 6 to the 83 times the modular inverse, 6 to the 83 times 6 would be equal to 1 mod 49. 1 mod 49. So 6 to the 83 is just whatever number times 6 is equal to 1 mod 89. So it's going to be equal to the modular inverse, mod 49. Because it's whatever number times 6 would be equal to 1. Right, so the reason this is true is because we have, if we multiply 6 to this left side and the right side, we get 6 to the 84, and 6 times the modular inverse is just 1, so we get 1 here. So that's essentially the logic behind this, if you found the previous explanation unclear. We did the same thing for 8, and then we just multi added them up and did our basic mods at the end. And that's it, we're done. But we're not done with this video. Next off, we've got binomial theorem. For non-negative n, we have the, this expansion here. x plus y to the n is just n to 0 times x to the n y to the 0 plus n to 1 x to the n minus 1 y and so on. All the way till n to the n x to the 0 y to the n. Okay, so what does that mean first of all? Basically, what that means is that if we expand out x plus y, the x to the n term will just have n to 0, or n to 0 as, as its coefficient. The x to the n minus 1 y term will just have n to 1 as its coefficients, and so on. Basically, for each x to the a, y to the b, the exponents of x and y's must sum to n. And then, because there's a total of n exponents, we choose any, you do n to 0 or n to the n. Remember from combo that they're equivalent. So basically, over here, we see that it just n choose whatever the power of y is. So n choose 0, n choose 1, n choose 2, so on, till n choose n. And we can also write it as n choose, we can rewrite in a different way, n choose n, n choose n minus 1, n choose n minus 2. Because remember from combo, n choose k and n choose n minus k, they're the same thing. So, okay, let's just see what an example of this might look like. For example, x plus y cubed is 3 choose 0 times x cubed plus 3 choose 1 times x squared y plus 3 choose 2 x y squared plus 3 choose 3 y cubed. And we can expand this out, you'll get your standard expansion you always know. Okay, so now we're actually going to be using binomial theorem in this number theory problem here. What is the hundredth digit of 2 to the 2011 to the power of 2011? Hmm. How do we do this? Well, the key thing to note here is that hundred digit, what, is, what does that mean? That means we're trying to find 2011 to the 2011 mod 1000. Why mod 1000? The reason we're doing mod 1000 is because to find the hundredth digit, we, we can also just find the last three digits and look at the hundredth digit from there. So mod 1000 is the way we'll go. So first of all, by our power rule, we know that this is just 11 mod, 11 to the 2011 mod 1000, right? Because 2011 is the same as 11 mod 1000. Okay, that's cool. Now, what is 11 to the 2011 mod 1000? Well, that's really the main point of the problem. We can try using Euler's quotient theorem, but you'll, you'll actually turn out we'll still, we'll still be left with some ugly expansions at the end. Is there anything else we can do? 
we can use the binomial theorem. Yes, in number theory. So basically the trick here is that we have 10 plus 1. We can rewrite 11 as 10 plus 1. Now why do we write it this way? Well, because we need to find mod 10 to the power of 3. This is just 10 cubed. So we, we might, might as well rewrite it as 10 plus something, mod 11, or 2011, sorry. Okay, so now, now the key thing to note here is that we can evaluate this using binomial theorem. This will be equal to 10 to the 2011 times 1 to 0 times 2011 to 0 times plus 10 to the 2010 1 to the 1 times 2011 Choose one. So now you might be thinking, why are we expanding this? There's 2012 terms you're never going to finish. Because the reason is we don't care about any of these terms. They all have giant powers of 10 in them. They're all way beyond multiples of 1,000. We only care about the terms that are not multiples of 1,000, which is just going to be the last few terms here. So it would be 2011, choose uh, 28, 2008. Right? So 2008 terms. So 2011 choose 2008. So that means there's three powers of 10 and 2008 powers of one. Oh, but this is still a multiple of a thousand. So we don't care. Okay, so now these next two terms are the crucial part. We've got 2011 to the 2000, choose 2009 times 10 squared, one to the 2009. Aha! This isn't a multiple of a thousand, so we have to include it in our last, in our that expression mod a thousand. Then we've got 2011 mod 2010, which is 10 to the 1, 1 to 2010. And finally, we've got 2011, choose 2011, times 10 to the 0, times 1 to the 2011. Okay, so we don't care about any of this stuff. It's all a giant multiple of a thousand that we're just going to kind of ignore. This is the part we really care about, all of this stuff here, because this part is not a multiple of a thousand, so we have to actually evaluate it. But that's not hard at all. 2011 times 2010 by 2 mod a thousand again, so let's just cancel, cancel, 1005. 1005 is the same as 5. 2011 is the same as 11. This is just 55. So we've got 55 times 100, 10 squared times 1. And then that's plus this term here. 2011 to 2010 is nothing but... 2011 to 2010 is nothing but 2011. So we have 2011 times 10 times a bunch of 1s. I'm not going to write 1s 2010 times. Plus 2011 to 2011. 1 times this thing, which is also 1, right? Because 10 to the 0 is 1. And now we're trying to find this mod uh, 1,000, so that's 5,500 plus 20110 plus 1. We ignore everything but the last three digits. We add them up to get 611, the final answer. Let's summarize. First, we immediately discarded these 2,000 stuff we don't care about to make this. Then we expanded using binomial theorem and realized that only the last three terms actually matter. And then we evaluated each of these easily by hand, of course, to get our answer by summing. Our cool application of the binomial theorem, if you ask me. But Chinese remainder theorem is also very powerful because it guarantees a solution to not just one mod equation, but multiple. And we've also got a technique for solving multiple linear congruences. And there's some cool problems that use it, like this one here. It's a cool problem, but we'll be discussing all of these techniques next video. Click on it right there. You can just 